So last year we started up the Tangled Filament Project, which was the goal of getting filament down to $10 a spool. Now while we've been doing extrusion before, we had to get another extruder in specifically for Tangled. And this is that extruder. Now there's a number of interesting quirks about this machine that we're going to talk about and how we would change it if we were building a new machine to actually make Tangled ourselves. So you start out with the actual extruder itself. Any given extruder generally has four heating regions. That's the typical way of heating up the barrel so that you can take the material from solid pellets all the way down to actual semi-liquid extrusion. Now, the temperatures of these are kind of arbitrary and dependent on the manufacturer itself. While the filament beads are given like a recipe to us, we are able to readjust that based on the speed that we're operating at and what we want that filament to be afterwards. If we're dealing with types of Pro PLA and like NGO 850, we would change these temperatures to change how tough or high, how high temp the material is when it comes out. So it's very arbitrary. Right now we're doing kind of a, just a general high temp to allow for the speed that we want to run this extruder at. Now, once the filament comes out, the very end of it all has this main die at the end, which has these heating elements. This has actually been the cause of the delay for us for the last couple of months, because these two heating elements on the original extruder had actually burned out because they were so old. So we actually had to order these in from the manufacturer to get these replaced, which caused the delay of our big batch of 4 kg spools. But we've got that up and fixed now. Once the filament comes out, it goes immediately into a hot bath. That hot bath allows the filament to start cooling without having a big old thermal shock. If we went from hot filament straight to cold water, then you get really dynamic radius changing because we don't have enough time to pull it out, draw it out, and smooth it out. So once the filament comes out of the die, it comes out at about two, maybe three millimeters in diameter, and then we start pulling it down. We have this uber hot chamber right here, which is fully heated, and then we go down to the slightly cooler chamber down here that is still warm, but cooling down just a little bit. And water is circulating between those two in order to allow it to, again, cool down. Then you move from the heated tank to the standard room temperature water. This transition right here is one of the toughest parts of first starting up this extruder because there's actual an oddity about this. You can see how these vats, these tanks, have these screw holes right here that we have to feed filament through. This is a hell hole because generally the right way of building this type of a tank would be with these slots in the top so that when you're threading it for the first time, it's able to fall into the water channels and you still have effectively a hole at both ends, but you have a top access point rather than having to thread it through. Now, the reason for these types of through holes on most tanks is in order to contain heat and have like a lid on top of these, but except for the heated area up top, it's really not necessary. And these open tanks just don't need it. So this is kind of a bug of how this extruder was manufactured and these tanks themselves. Whenever we build our new own custom extruders, we would definitely have V-tops. And whenever we're shopping for them, we end up always buying those. But with this particular extruder, it, you kind of get what you were paying for. And we were looking for a deal in order to get a minimum viable product out the door to start scaling up filament to lower the cost. And this is kind of what you have to live with. Once it's running, it's not that big of a deal because once extrusion is running, you can run for 24 or 36 hours without having to stop and break it outside of really odd errors that you can generally mitigate for. So we go here into the main channel and we have this long cooling channel right here that's about 12, 15 feet long. Now, the water down inside of here is cool and is fully recirculated. We want to add on, most, most of these tanks and most extruders do not have active filtration inside of them. We would have to add that on ourselves even if we were buying a larger, more expensive version of this. They're just designed to circulate water. And this is a really odd kind of side effect of what these extrusion lines were designed for. These were not designed for making high precision filament. They were designed for making weed whacker filament and then they started being used for 3D printer filament as time went by. But not having filtration introduces opportunities for contamination. Now we mitigate for that by changing out this water regularly after each batch, but it's not a good way of doing it. It should be actively filtered. One of the ways we're gonna do it kind of with this setup is literally to just get in like hot tub sand filters that are able to take out any major particulates and make sure that the water is clean and clear and is constantly recirculating while still being able to deal with the higher temperatures that we deal with. The filament coming down through here moves at about this speed right here. That's about how fast it's moving at any given time. So quite a few feet per second. But at the very end here, we get to this main air curtain, which is at the very end of the extrusion line. And this air curtain is a really odd sort of a device because even though this was designed to be machined, this is an excellent example 
of a part that should be 3D printed. What it's doing is it's shooting compressed air back up the filament to blow off any water so that it comes off dry as soon as it comes out of those tanks. But because this has to be machined, it has to be built in two halves to clamshell together so that you have that contained air. We're gonna redesign in a future video a 3D printed version of this that has multiple channels spinning around so that we're able to send kind of a spiral shooting air going back up into there so it's way more consistent, way better at drying with less air pressure and just a better system as a whole because this is a bunch of screws and two halves and tubes going everywhere and it's not necessary. This is almost like a rocket nozzle that could just be combined into one 3D printed part. So we'll show you that in the future. Next we come down to the polar and the polar is what's actually bringing the filament along. Once it's extruded it goes right into these rollers and is pulled through. So controlling the speed of this is how you control the diameter of the filament. If we pull it faster, it gets thinner. If we pull it slower, it gets fatter. Now, this has been a bottleneck for extrusion from the very beginning because this thing actually cannot go as fast as that extruder can extrude. And it certainly can't go as fast as we would want it to be able to pull. One of the first ways we hacked this was we ended up changing the pulley. And you can see that in a past video that we did where we redesigned this pulley from a cast iron version. We increased the diameter of that pulley in order to let this go faster because we couldn't twist up the speed knob on it any more than we had before. But it's still going too slow. So we're going to be upgrading the size of that as time goes by here too so that we can get more filament shoved through here because we're able to pump a lot more heat into that without having bad filament so that we can pull it out a lot more quickly. Because the faster we can extrude filament and use human time effectively, the cheaper we can drive down that cost and get closer to 10 bucks. Now, once we get out of the polar, it goes into the QC checker, the dimension checker, where we are constantly monitoring the diameter of the filament to make sure that it's staying the constant 1.75. Right now, we're at a plus or minus 0.05 millimeters, which is good and will work in any 3D printer. We're working in to tighten that down, but literally that's done by controlling kind of the temps and the length of the tanks up there. The other issues with those tanks is that they're actually too short. As we start going faster, the filament doesn't have enough time to cool in those tanks. So we need to make them longer and have better feedback on them so that the filament has time to cool and settle as fast as we're extruding it from the machine. Again, since filament has always been made to be this kind of low grade weed whacker wire, it's never had to be produced in large volumes with really high constant diameter. So the entire way of doing extrusion kind of needs to be revamped. And this is another example of it. This winder right here is terrible for reducing the cost of filament because it has two small spool holders that are designed for 1kg to 3kg, but it requires somebody to be here to monitor them both times to swap in between. Once one spool is done, you put on a new one and rewind it, and then you go and work on this one while the other one is spooling up, and then you pull it off and switch back and forth. And that's fine, but it's a really inefficient way of doing it because you're not able to have a lot of parallelization. What we do to get past this is we actually have our own internal winder for these really large spools. Now, this is effective, the dumbest form of automation you can get, where you just fill in a huge amount of material so that you only have to switch once every hour or two as this thing is filling up. So this lets us get a lot of material down onto a spool and extruded from the machine without a lot of human monitoring so that we can really reduce the cost. This would then go into our spooling station where it's run in parallel so that lots of spools are spooling down at the same time so that human time is used really efficiently and it's able to spool down much more quickly. Now, all that I just showed you is the complete wrong way of making filament, but it is the way that everyone makes filament. But all of this extrusion equipment has been designed for not making 3D printer filament. It's a 20 year old design for making weed whacker wire that has been obtained and used to make filament, but it's not the right way of doing it. We've been doing a really good job of hacking and tuning the industry as a whole to make good quality material out of this, but it's all entirely incorrect. If you want to reduce the cost of filament, this extruder has to be bigger. And by bigger, I mainly mean longer. We, we need to have more heating regions so that the filament has more time to melt so that we can go faster and extrude it more quickly. We also need to have much longer cooling channels so that it has time to cool down when you're extruding much more quickly while still maintaining a constant and reliable diameter. And then you have to change the winding machines to be more automated. A winding machine should go one spool right here and then pop over and spool another spool over there. Or have a robot arm attending it or something along those lines. Those are very simple operations that are well understood in manufacturing that just aren't used because filament has never had the volume. Part of the reason for us wanting to decrease the cost of filament so much 
is to enable that volume so that you can enable all the optimization. This is a small, almost hobby level extruder. It is not right for really large mass production. Now, while it meets the demands of the, the tangled demand and that kind of thing, and we're getting another extruder in to support tangled over time, it's not right for large scale mass production. We will not replace injection molding beads using these sides of extruders. They gotta be big and nothing is made big right now because extruding high tolerance wire has never been a necessity until right now. So all of this needs re-engineered. So hopefully this was a little bit useful to you to see kind of the wrong way of making filament. It works and it's what everybody uses, but this machine obviously has a number of quirks with it because it was a get the job done quickly solution. But there's so much more that filament extrusion needs and so much more work to be done in order to allow the industry to increase the scale, reduce the cost, and really enable mass production 3D printing at the same or larger scales than injection molding.